Well, hello everyone. On behalf of the team from Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy, would like to welcome you to today's webinar, 40 years of cover crop experience with our good friend, David Brandt. A couple of housekeeping things, please make sure and have your device on mute so we do not have background noise interrupting the webinar. Also, please uh, enter any questions into the Q&A section. And at the end of the presentation tonight, we will be going through and answering as many of those questions as time permits. You know, it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce a dear friend and a mentor of mine and a mentor of all of ours, David Brandt. I'll never forget the first time I met David. I had heard about this guy and read articles about him. And uh, he's larger than life in the fact that David is always willing to share a laugh and a smile. And most importantly, he's a good person. And all he wants to do is help move people down the regenerative path. You know, I have the good fortune of traveling all over the world and no matter where I go, people ask me about David and Kendra Brandt and how special their place is and the work that he's done. And uh, we have a very, very large contingency of people from all over the world tuning into this webinar. And it's because of who David is and the work that him and Kendra have done. In fact, David, not too long ago, was named one of the 25 most influential agriculturalists in the world. And it's a, it's a uh, real honor and pleasure to introduce him and he's well deserving of that award. So with that, David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Gabe. And uh, I wanna thank Understanding Ag for asking me to uh, do this webinar. It's, uh, I always enjoy doing them and uh, sharing what little bit we have learned over the past almost 50 years now, Gabe. Uh, and uh, the snapshot you see on your screen now is our homestead. Uh, this happens to be a picture in December. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of tillage being done around our farm. So if you come to visit, if you find a green field, we farm it. Uh, uh, we bought this farm in 1971 and it has not been tilled since then. It's had numerous cover crops. Uh, from single species to as many as 25 at one time. Uh, we have changed a lot of the water infiltration on this farm, and we also have gained organic matter. When I bought the farm, it was about 1%, and today it's setting right close to 8.1% organic matter on this farm. Uh, I sometimes like to, I'm old enough that I can reminisce about history, but first, the reason why I got started in, in looking at no-till back in the early, late 60s was we farmed a lot of highly erodible land. We didn't know it was called highly erodible at that time, but we were probably losing about 10 to 12 tons of soil from tillage. And I just I had made up my mind that we just had to do something different. Uh, we also, at that point in time, had about 200 Charlay cows with calves and 200 sows prepared to finish, and I was just running out of time not to do field work. So we invested in the first, uh, well, it wasn't the first Alice Chalmers planter, but the first, the second year Alice Chalmers made no-till planters. So this was our first planter. And all the comments around from the community was, well, we only had a 40 horse tractor. How much horsepower does it take to pull this planter? So we got with some Amish that lives close to us and we said, how much will it take? And so I guess I'll have to just tell you that a two row Alice Chalmers planter takes four horsepower to pull it. Uh, you know, we have done a lot of things and seen a lot of equipment changes. This planter didn't even have a monitor on it. So you had to kind of stop and make sure that it was planting every round or have somebody watch the every, all the chains so they didn't fall off, you know. We did a lot of pasture interseedings and this was called a zip seeder. And uh, what it was, it was just a flat piece of metal on a shaft and 
if it didn't cut very well, you just kept throwing cement blocks in the box till it did, you know. Uh, so these were the first planters and no-till drills that we worked with. Uh, back in the early 70s, I met Sam Moore from Northern Ireland, and him and I decided we would probably bring some drills over from Ireland. So this was his drill, and it did a superb job of planting clovers and alfalfas and and small grains. When we put soybeans in it, we ruined it. And I never will forget, I call him up and I says, we gotta change the metering system. And he says, what are you doing? And I said, we're planting beans. And he said, I don't know what that is. And, and so I sent him a bag and he, he called me back up and he says, you bloody guys, you wanted to do everything. And I said, that's right. He even put me to bed at night if it would, you know. So uh, we learned a lot about planters. But the nice thing about it, as we mature through the years, over this 50 or 60 years that we've been working with no-till, equipment now that you buy will do no-till, will plant in cover crops, will plant different species at one time. It is so much easier today to go to no-till if you're a conventional farmer, just because the equipment is heavy enough, built good enough to do what we want to do time after time. We tend to try to plant everything green. And this is just another planter that I think works really well. This happens to be our home planter. It's an eight row 30 with uh, seven splitters in between and we'll talk more about that as we go through. But we enjoy planting green. I think it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to get the crop in the ground. So as we move on to that, we start, and I like to talk to farmers that, from conventional farmers that come and ask me how I can get started. You know, they're used to brown soil, so I try to convince them about using some rye behind the corn crop, going to soybeans. It gets them used to looking at rye as it grows. So this happens to be one that had 40 pounds of rye that was broadcast out of a fertilizer spreader and not even worked the ground. And that's the kind of stand we got. We can do it with a splitter planter. This is 15 inch rows. This is 12 and a half pound of rye in 15 inch rows. I don't think it's quite enough because we had some weeds and you, and you can see a little bit of mustard coming back there. So we upped it to 30 pounds and we was able to suppress a tremendous amount of weeds with 15 inch row rye. And as we go on, this is our new planter and this is how we plant our soybeans. As far as David's concerned, the bigger and taller the rye is, the easier it is to do. And the reason I say that is because if it's in the head stage, we can do a lot of things to make this work. We can plant through it. You can, you can roll it down before you plant. I prefer not to do that because it's harder to find your mark. I like to use the planter when it's standing and then roll the crop afterwards because it will help cover up some of the misadjustments on the planter if you have them, you know. Uh, so here we're rolling rye after we've probably, this was before we planted because this rye was about seven and a half foot tall and about 32,000 pounds of biomass that we was going into. Uh, this happens to be an INJ crop roller, it's a 20 footer. We pull it with a 60 horse tractor my wife does the majority of the crop rolling and she just seems to enjoy to be outside and, and get things accomplished. If we can have this kind of cover and we can roll it down, probably 80 to 90% of the time, we never have to go back and use a herbicide, which is a real plus for us. Most generally we get by with our bean crop with no application of herbicide. Depends on the weather, depends on your management strategy. I don't have a problem with using herbicides, but I just don't like to spend money. So if we can do it with a crop roller and a little bit of fuel in the tractor, it seems to work so much better for us. And what we're after in these soybeans is to have this brown residue that protects the soil keeps the soil cooler during the summer. And actually, like the, I feel that it actually ties up some nitrogen in the early spring. So as the beans come up, they tend to want to nodulate more, put more nodulation in the soil, 
So that means they're taking more nitrogen out of the atmosphere and putting them into roots. And as you can see, look how close they have potted. The nodes are close. There's probably three to five beans pods with at least three to four beans. I can almost guarantee every farmer that goes from conventional tillage to using rye four more bushel of beans per acre than he would do conventional. We also see what happens here with this residue. We do not have the soil moving. We talked earlier about losing 10 ton of soil without covers. We are now down to less than 200 pounds of soil per year loss off our farm. That means a lot to us. That means a lot of our nutrients are staying where it belongs. So that means we don't have to buy as much nutrients because we're not losing them. And we also see the plants being more healthy, you know, and things look really good, work really well with this cover. Uh, just thought I would throw some cost figures to you for what we have. Everybody wants to know, well, can we make money with covers? Uh, our rye cost in the fall into the corn fodder is about nine bucks an acre. Our non-GMO seed cost is 42. We never use fertilizer going to beans after corn. Our equipment costs, and this is the equipment cost is figured the actual cost of fuel, grease, oil, tires, and the machine we're using. So in this case, all we're using is a planter, a crop roller, and a combine. So the other equipment is not involved in this operation, so it didn't have that expense. Our average crash rent is 150. I, that may be cheap, it may be high, I don't know, but that's what our average is. So our total cost of production in 2018 was $235.28. In October when we harvested the beans, the beans were worth $8.40 at our ADM terminal. So on our farm, it took 28.1 bushel to break even. Our average soybean yield in 2018 was 72 bushel. So we had a $369.52 net profit from variable cost, which made my banker really happy. As we switch gears and talk about corn, for, for about 30 years we used single species, which would have been like buckwheat and other things, and we'll talk about these others. But as we learned about these crops, we learned about buckwheat by looking at what it would do in the soil. It's a fibrous root system, probably about three to five to six inches deep. Lots of fibrous roots on the surface. When we use buckwheat on the surface and let it either terminate itself or roll it or use a chemical on it, we see that we do not have crusting problems when we have a rainfall event. We also noticed in our soil samples year after year where we put buckwheat in the field, we would see phosphorus readings going up probably as much as 15 to 20 pounds per acre. I don't know why, I just know something's happening. I was told by Dr. Dafik Islam that the buckwheat roots give off an enzyme that actually takes unavailable phosphorus and makes it available to the next plant you're going to use, utilize in the field. I'm glad it happens. That just means we don't have to buy 15 or 20 pounds of phosphorus for the next crop. We use a tremendous amount of hairy vetch. I really like it. It's a great nitrogen source. Uh, this shows uh, six pounds of hairy vetch planted after wheat and how well it's growing. And this was just before planting corn. Uh, I must tell you that uh, if you're in there with a drill or a planter and you have loose chains or you have row cleaners, you want to pull them up or take them off because it will actually do a fair job of tangling up some of that stuff. So these are things we had to learn. So what we do, we take a rub, put a rub bar on the planter so it rubs it forward, lays it flatter down so that it don't catch on the chains or doesn't catch as much on the spike closing wheels or the road cleaners. 
winter peas are a real nice legume. And the reason I'm showing these is spangles, singles, we did this for 30 years. I never understood till about 2002 when I met Gabe Brown that more than one species would grow in the field. You know, we don't have corn, soybeans, and wheat the same year growing in the field. We just have corn or we have soybeans or we have wheat, you know. But we'll talk about blends here a little bit later. So this is how we learned about what's going on. So this is 30 pounds of winter peas. And I wanna show you some other things that would happen with them. This is crimson clover. These are all cool season legumes that will put lots of or atmospheric nitrogen in the soil profile to be utilized by a grass crop such as corn or wheat or even pastures will work well with the, some of these legumes if we can get them to grow, you know. What I really like to talk about is the nodulation of the roots. And here you can see the nodulation from the winter pea. And these are what we're looking at because these will stay there. They're an organic form of nitrogen. They will not leave the soil. They will not wash away. And it's available to the plant as the root gets involved in there. So in, in the 80s, when I was working real diligently, trying to figure out what cover crops would give me the most nitrogen, I went to the university, Ohio State. I also talked to Kentucky and also talked to Penn State. And I said, we have these legumes. And I mentioned all these to them in different areas. Can you tell me how much nitrogen I might be able to credit for these plants to a growing corn crop. Dear Mr. Brand, the only way we can credit these accounts, account, uh, nitrogen accounts to you, is you need to bury the residue. I fired a letter back to all three universities saying we do not have the ability to bury it. So we did our own study. This was a five year study that we put on our own farm where we had 10 acres of each one of these legumes with corn growing in it. And we took the nitrogen rate from 200 units down to zero. And wherever the corn yielded the same, at whatever nitrogen rate it was at 200, I figured that's what these plants did for us. So if we're looking at this and we're talking about blending cover crops for corn utilization of nitrogen out of the atmosphere, we look at warm season legumes such as sun hemp and cowpea. We also put cool season legumes with that, which is winter pea, hairy vetch, and crimson clover are the ones I really like the most. And we can probably accumulate from the atmosphere into the root zone around the nodulation somewhere around 400 units of N. A lot of farmers say, well, that's a lot of nitrogen. I said, well, if it's only half of that, I'm still happy, you know. Uh, in, 19, in 1996, I met Steve Graw, and he says, well, David, he says, I have this tillage reddish, and we'd like for you to do some work. So I worked with Steve, trying to figure out how to make tillage reddishes work for him and for everyone else. So we came up with planting a, a row of reddishes and a row of winter pea side by side. These are 15-inch rows, alternating back and forth. And we watched what happened. As we watched what happened, we saw the reddishes getting larger in the soil. We saw the peas putting on more nodulation in the soil. And when you do these kind of things, you have to be in the field with your shovel and dig and understand. You know, uh, it's fun to do this, I think. You know, it's fun to figure out how to lower your input cost if you can. Uh, and I've never had anybody tell me why the reddishes grow out of the ground like these do. And I'm gonna tell you it's from Dave Brandt University. I think the reddish has to get big enough in the tuber to push the tap root through the hard pan. Because the hard pan in this field was about seven inches deep. The tubers come out of the ground seven inches and then the tap root went through the hard pan after it broke through the hard pan, the tuber got big underneath there again. So 
I'm saying that tuber or that reddish has to have enough weight to get that root mass through there. One nice thing about having reddishes in a row with a planter that puts one seed every four and a half inches apart, that means we use three quarters of a pound of reddishes per acre. And that's pretty cheap at $1.85 a pound for reddishes. We also sow 15 pounds of winter peas. So we end up somewhere with about the $14 to $15 an acre with a cover crop cost for seasonally planted. The neat thing was that here you can see the tuber. It hit a hard place and then it broke through the hard pan and went down and this root actually went 47 inches deep in the soil. Uh, it also, you can notice the, the soil profile at the top. As these reddishes grow and they're in a row, they tend to become my strip till machine because they lift the soil about an inch and a half or two inches, which is great. You can come right back in in the spring with the planter and plant corn right on that reddish row. Uh, I know the first year that I done this, we had about 60 acres of it. And it was March the 2nd, and it was, the ground was thawing out. And man, all of a sudden, two o'clock in the morning, there was fire departments and gas companies and deputy sheriffs and state patrols on the farm honking and raising cane and got me out of bed. And they said, you got a natural gas leak, Mr. Brandt? And I said, no. I said, that's the reddish, you know. So we had to teach them how these things do. And I thought, boy, this first year, if they smell that bad, Will anything grow? But man, did the corn ever grow, you know. Here's what we like to see. 18 to 20 inch tuber, then the taproot going on. The neat thing about this is we're only about 16 or 17 miles from Ohio's capital, which is Columbus. There is a lot of foreign people there and they love daikon seed radishes. And when we have them like this, we can sell them for two and a half bucks a piece if they dig them, you know. So it's another way to help pay for the cover crop. Again, we want to talk about nitrogen fixation, why we want to do it, you know. And this is just another picture that I think I'd like to remind you that why are we buying nitrogen for corn and for wheat if you're in a rotation where you can grow a cover crop ahead of a grass crop and capture from 45 to 160 pounds of nitrogen sequestered in the soil for the next crop. You know, if nitrogen is 30 cents a pound, that's a pretty good return on a 15 or a $20 an acre cover crop cost. We got Ohio State University really interested in it and Dr. Lafitte was, was really a, a good professor for me to work with and so he sent interns down and they did a five-year study evaluating the soils from where we had peas and radishes and every time for five years when we planted a different field we'd call them and they would send these interns down and they would dig soil and take it back to the lab and so this was the average nutrients they found in our soils above the soil sample readings. So they would find 250 pounds of nitrogen, 23 pounds of phosphorus, 230 pounds of potash, 60 pounds of sulfur, 150 pounds of calcium. That 150 pounds of calcium equals about 11 or 1200 pounds of spread lime a year. On our home farm, when we bought it in 71, we spread two ton of lime. We have not spread any lime since 1971. And our pH is seven. And I, I say it's because the cover crops are bringing up enough calcium to keep everything balanced. So in this case, David does not need to buy any nutrients to grow corn. Another thing they did a lot of work with was did it actually, did the reddish actually loosen the soil? So on the graph on the left, you will see the dark colored zeros or dots. That is where the reddishes is. The light colored dots are conventional field, same soil type, just across the road. So if we're looking at one to two inches, they really loosen the soil. It only didn't make any effort to push the meter in the ground. If we look at 22 inches deep where the reddishes 
tap roots was it took about 200 or 160 pounds of pressure where the radishes were. Where in conventional tillage, it took almost 260 pounds of pressure to push a probe in the ground. Yes, the cover crops will loosen the soil. Yes, the cover crops will help with water infiltration. Yes, cover crops will put nutrients back in the soil and bring nutrients to the surface to help you produce a crop. I think it's very important to have a three-year rotation. We farm 933 acres. We have 300 acres, 310 acres of corn. We have 310 acres of soybeans, and we have 310 acres of small grains. That makes it easy for David because I know what goes in that field next year. I don't have to worry about what my rotation is because we're on the thirds. The neat thing about having small grains in the rotation, they come off in all, uh, July. We directly go in after July and sow cover crops. So we end up from August, September, October, and part of November growing green covers that will put on deep roots. You can't have that happening when you're in a corn and bean rotation and plant in October and it freezes in November where it won't grow anymore. The cover crop never gets big enough to break through some of the compaction and hard pans in a two year rotation. I try to talk to farmers that want to use rye, just plant enough rye that you can harvest it and use it yourself. You know, that will give them a chance. Maybe they put 10 acres of rye out on 1,000 acres. So, you know, maybe in 10 years or 12 years, they can be partly around with their rotation and have big covers crops in there to help them. The main thing with all crops that you harvest with these combines today, and we have a 30 foot platform and we can throw the residue 30 foot, but I've seen combines with 40 and 45 foot headers that only throw it 20 foot. If you put all that residue in the 10 to 20 foot band, it will be tough to get a crop to grow in that residue if you're no tilling. There's things you can do. You can increase the air to blow the residue out farther. You can put chaff spreaders on, or all you have sometimes all you have to do is just speed up the spinner. Spinner. Most most of them are hydraulics now, so just speed it up to two or three hundred more RPMs, and it'll throw it the forty foot that you need to throw that residue. You have to start planning ahead before you go to no-till and cover crop. So in 2004 or five, four, I think it was when I met Gabe, we got interested in covers. So this is a cover crop that's left over from a 10-way species that we'll plant corn into. The white flower is balanza clover. The red flower is crimson clover. The purple flower is hairy vetch. There may be a winter pea or two in there and there's some rye. We like to keep the rye down because we're planting corn and corn's a grass and so is rye. So we use a limited amount of rye, probably 15 to 30 pounds per acre if we're going to corn. With these three or four legumes, we can actually accumulate a lot of atmospheric nitrogen that's gonna help us lower our input costs on commercial fertilizers. Another plant we use a lot of if we're in the fall where, we're, where the soil temperature gets below 70 degrees is Priscilla. And that's the purple plant you see here. I really like this plant because it has a tremendous root system. It will go 30 to 40 inches deep from September till December. Uh, with rye, it really works well if you're gonna go to soybeans. We found by accident by using balanza clover that balanza seems to enjoy wet holes in the field where water may be ponding for two or three or four days or just saturated soils for two or three days and nothing else grows. The balanza seems to hold in there. I would never recommend more than one pound per acre. There's 800,000 seeds of balanza in a pound, so that's plenty. And if you notice, if you use balanza, if you go up on where the soils are drier, you won't see much balanza clover. That's where the hairy vetch and the winter peas and the crimson and the rye will grow. 
Uh, we like to talk about diversity. We like to put sunflowers in our mixes, mainly because our neighbors don't call them weed patches in. And my landlords love them. Once you put sunflowers where you have a 70 or 80 year landlord, you got that farm forever. It's a lot of fun to take her four or five sunflowers for about three weeks in a mason jar and tell her how much you appreciate farming her farm, you know. And the neat thing about the sunflowers, they bloom and they bring beneficial insects. For two years, we thought that's all they did. After we run some soil samples, we saw our zinc and magnesium levels coming up from the use of the sunflower. So we are now starting to learn what some of these cover crop species can do as far as bringing nutrients to the surface that's somewhere in a profile that has not been available in the years to come, you know. Again, the sunflower brings the beneficial insects. For 11 years now, we've not used a fungicide or insecticide on any crop that we grow, just because we have enough beneficials that will suppress the problem uh, pests that we have. Uh, we can get big blended cover crops, and this happens to be a high carbon crop that we like really well. Uh, if we have farms that have very low organic matter, we'll put a very high carbon crop in the first year to really start to jump start some of the biologicals that we need to have and also to help increase organic matter. When we have this type of covers, we can usually increase our organic matter in the top six inches, six inches by a half a percent a year. And this happens to be sedan sorghum, sun hemp, uh, cow pea, some soybeans. Uh, there may be some BMR corn in there. Uh, underneath the canopy then we'll have Crimson clover, hairy vetch, winter pea, uh, and some rye and barley. And what I want to show you, and this is not really cover crops, but these are uh, plants that I want to show you how different the roots are of these plants. Some plants are tall and have long roots. Some plants are short but have long roots. And some plants are short and don't have very long roots. So what we're trying to do is we'd like to mimic the mother nature's what she does like in a woodlot to have big and tall trees but we also want to have those roots doing the same thing you know if we can have plants that we can have out there for 60 to 90 days and have 40 to 60 inch roots just think what that does to your profile in loosening the soil and increasing water holding capacity and eliminating erosion Uh, we have come up with some mixes. We have a scavenger mix, it's a 10-way mix, it's a high-carbon mix. Really a nice mix to put in after wheat if you're going to do any type of livestock grazing, or maybe you need an emergency hay, hay source, or maybe you just some, want something there when it frosts down and kills that you can put the cows on in the wintertime and just let them rummage through it and put their manure out in the field instead of in the barn. But this was planted on August or July the 23rd, and this is September 23rd, and we had 24,000 pounds of biomass with less than an inch of rain during those two months periods. 2012 was the drought year for Ohio. We only had 8.8 .8 inches of rain the whole year. Opposite of that, in 2018, we had 67 inches of rain. 2019, we had 57 inches of rain. So I don't know whether we're in the monsoons or what, you know. Just want to show you how nice it is to pull a planter in a cover crop field. This cover crop was rolled. This has hairy vetch, winter peas, crimson clover. If you'll notice, there's no dust on the planter. The tractor performs a lot easier we can save about 7% of the fuel consumption on a cover crop field versus a conventional. The same thing we see with harvest. Our combine is about 6% more efficient running on cover crops, you know. And I think it's the little things, the little nickels and dimes and pennies that we save 
that adds up to be big dollars to make everybody more profitable. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button again. What did I do wrong? Come on, go. I'll find it here. Come on, picture. I'll let it run more one more time so everybody can see how nice that works. You know, and then we'll go on. Okay, sorry about that, guys. My technical ability is bad. Oh, there it is. This is uh, this was a CRP farm that we took over three years ago. It was a CRP for 10 years. We had permission three months before the CRP contract to go in and terminate what was there with a herbicide program. We come back with a 12-way species, and we ended up with 42,000 pounds of green biomass we planted into. And here you can see just where the planter ran through and planted the corn. And here the corn's coming up through uh, with no starter fertilizer, no herbicide, no insecticide, no seed corn treatment, and it's growing pretty well. And there was the results of what we had. You know, and I'm quite proud of that. Uh, because I know our NRCS office said that no one ever had success growing corn in CRP without tilling. So we took 10 years of CRP that they had very little soil loss from and continue not to have soil loss by growing row crops on it. So our corn production uh, in 2018, I thought you might be interested in and uh, 18 was a year that we had not very much cover crop because of the rain and it was cold. So in the, in the summer, after wheat, we had $25 in the cost of the cover crop. We had non-GMO seed corn at $66.81 an acre. We had to use a little bit of burn down because none of the cover crops got tall enough to roll to terminate. We still rolled them, but we still had to use some burn down to make sure they died. We use a little bit of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, a little bit more of equipment because we had to use the sprayer uh, there. Our land rents the same cost. We had $334.85 an acre out of pocket cost. In, two, in 2018, the corn was worth $3.11. It cost, took 107 bushel, 107.6 bushel to pay the out-of-pocket expense, and we averaged 192. So we still made a marginal profit on our corn in 2018. We're trying to do a lot of work trying to figure out how corn responds to cover crops and how it responds with no fertilizer. And I'm really interested in building a protein market for our non-GMO grains. So for three, for five years, we've done protein and fields with no fertilizer, our protein's running 9.1. I worked with our agronomist, he says, we gotta keep using fertilizer, David, so in some fields we half rate it to make him happy and we lose about a point of protein. And then I have about four acres that I let him spend all the money he wants to spend, try to produce more corn that we can grow without fertilizer and we haven't done that yet. But with all the fertilizer he would recommend, our protein goes down to 7.5 with cover crops. Without cover crops, conventionally tilled, the same variety of corn had 5.1 protein. Can you imagine if you're feeding livestock or want to sell your grain to a livestock producer, what the difference is between five and 9% protein? Could be lots of money difference there. Another thing we found out was with our cover crops during the summertime, our soils are about 20 degrees cooler. And by that, we mean by having cooler soils, we have the microbial activity at the highest rates we can have because that soil never gets hardly above 85 degrees. At 97 degrees, most biological activities slows down or ceases, you know. 
So the field on the right is 91 or 97 there. Uh, it's pretty well just they're waiting for it to cool off or rain on it, you know. Where on the left side of the picture with the residue, uh, we, we're cooler and the corn's coming up and looking pretty good, you know. I also think, and I, no one's ever told me, but I think every time we have a rainfall event with that amount of cover on the picture on the left, we uh, have some type of compost tea because I think the rain goes through the residue, takes the nutrients out of the residue, and deposits it on the soil surface because the plants always green up and grow faster after a rainfall event. A lot of questions have been asked to me. Well, how can I get it done? I'm busy harvesting. I don't have time to get cover crops in the fall. How can I do this, David? Can we aerial seed? Can we do all this? Can we do that? Yes, you can. Farmers are innovators. This is a guy in Indiana that I work with, and he decided he just put a Gandy cedar, and he sows three pounds of annual ryegrass, and he said, I could make about four hoppers full of corn. And he's an old fellow, and he said, by that time, I have to get out and walk around so I can put some more annual ryegrass in the cedar. And they blow that underneath the header, you know. I worked with another farmer that bought a Krauss or a Lexion combine. So guess what? We put a cedar on there that lasts all day. So you don't have to stop. He says, I ain't got time to stop, David. We're dump on the run. Well, we'll put something big enough on there that won't hurt the combine. And he and you can see that the tubes go underneath and he blows everything underneath the header. When he's done combining, his cover crops are seeded. You know. Other ways to get cover crop in. There's a lot of work being done on knee-high corn or shorter to going in and interseeding cover crops. Here we have to be concerned with your herbicide program, understand what you're using. So a lot of fellows are, are lowering the rates of herbicides or using herbicides that have very, very short residual life. And then probably in three or four or five weeks after planting, you can go in and interseed multiple species. Hopefully they grow enough that some of the species would collect atmospheric nitrogen and benefit the corn. Uh, this happens to be our high boy cedar. Uh, this is quite a unique tool. We took a high uh, sprayer. It's an old walker sprayer. We took the tank off of it. We put a Montag air system box on and we can blow cover crops in 36 rows of corn or soybeans uh, clear through uh, 12 foot tall corn. And it works fairly well, you know. The biggest disadvantage is if you're doing custom work and you happen to hit a tile hole in the field, it kind of makes a U-turn and, and you wonder if, if you got enough clothes on to take care of the problem, you know. But um, here's what our interseeders look like when we're done. You can harvest a crop and here comes the rye for soybeans next year, you know. This is like 35 pound of rye blown on when the corn was just tossing. A lot of interest in now in interseedings or in what I'm going to call double crop or multiple two crops in one year. You can take, you know, if you have engineering ability or if you want to spend a lot of time, just drop off two row units off your drills and off your run. You can grow wheat, you can plant soybeans in between the rows, you can harvest the wheat and have double and have some better than double crop beans there, or you could use covers here, you know. And here's a fellow I worked with that had a 20 inch planter. So we planted a 20 inch wheat. The wheat made 47 bushels of the acre. He went right in this spring and planted the soybeans. You can see them growing there and they made 52. So he, he had two crops in one year. Just some ideas about how you could stretch out some things that you may want to do and collect more sunlight to help. How do we know how much nutrients we get from our covers? So what we do, we use a uh, Sabita flag, which will give us the amount of CO2 leaving the soil during the day. It's only good for the day you use it, but it will tell you whether there's enough carbon dioxide in the soil. And to me, that equals a pound of nitrogen for the corn. So if we see the flags between two and a half to five, we have plenty of 
carbon in the soil to make a crop of corn. We also use a spad meter. Uh, what this does, it, it checks the chlorophyll in the leaf. The amount of chlorophyll in the leaf will tell you how much nitrogen that plant's taken up. And on our farm, if this meter reads 42 parts per million, we have enough chlorophyll in the leaf for 200 bushel corn. So this said 57, so we're in excess of what we need. Another nice thing we can do with covers, it can stretch your pastures. You know, uh, we have several fellows. We don't have any livestock on our farm yet, but there will be someday. But uh, we have fellows that we work with that plant a eight or 10 way species after wheat, let it grow up, and then in September, they put their calves in there. These are stalkers. Uh, for three years, this fella has grown stalkers in cover crops and they gain four, 3.9 to 4.2 pound a day eating the residue. In this case, we allow them to eat about half of what you, well, about a fourth of what you see. They mop down about 40% of what you see and then you take them out, you know. Uh, some other interesting things, we, we do a lot of work with hybrids. I like to know if a seed salesman come to me and he says, I got corn, it'll produce 300 bushel of the acre. And I said, I just need one bag. Let me try it out. Because our soils are different. It's not, our soils are different because they're more healthy. They have lots of microbial activity. They have lots of nutrients in the soils. But what I want to show you here is where this yellow square is. If we look across, and this was 111 day variety, two 111 day varieties, you can see the numbers there, they're 6105 and 6115. The plants stand with about the same 32,000, but look at the yield difference. And the only thing different here is the variety. I'm just saying, this company told me that 6105 was the best corn they had in conventional. Well, in our plot, it was the worst corn we had. It only returned $59.66 an acre versus $228 an acre, just on variety. I think if you're going to grow cover crops and you're going to do no-till, you need to do some of your own research because today's combines all have yield monitors and it's real easy to do, you know. And first, I want to apologize for this, but this was our two-year study and all I wanted to show you here was the protein. And we look at 18 or 19's protein. These are varieties we had at 19. And all corns aren't the same, fellas and gals. If we look down here, we had an open pollinated corn. It only made 140 bushel, or 104 bushel, but it had 11% protein. Our finish in hog ration is 12%. We do not have to buy much bean meal to make a 12% ration for our finish hogs. We go on down here, some of these varieties, there's a spectrum variety that only had 6.8. The only difference here, same soils, same conditions, same fertilizer rates, same planting dates, is the variety. So how important is varieties to do what you want to do? ADM, Cargill, and Bungie don't care. You know, what I wanted to show you was how we've changed our soils. On the right hand side is soil from 1971 when we bought my grandfather's farm. That's 1% organic matter. That's Carnington clay base loam soils. On the left is the same soil without a name because nobody knows what to call it. And it's got 8% organic matter. That's what we've done after 45 years of no-till with cover crops. The rewards are 229 bushel with 50 pound of nitrogen. And I showed Gabe this and I talked to Gabe and he says, why did you use 50 pound of nitrogen? I could sleep better, you know. I wanna thank you all for listening to me and joining the website. And this is an upcoming web and our, that Gabe will be more likely talking to you about. Well, thank you, David. That was really inspiring to see all you've done and 
And I hope all, everyone who is watching the webinar or listening in uh, really understood the magnitude of the change you've been able to make on your farms. Having been there a number of times and, and dug down and looked at your neighbor's soils and seen the difference just four or five feet away on, on your farm, uh, I can't uh, tell people enough the difference. It, it's truly inspirational to see and it goes to show that a person's farm or ranch is a direct reflection of them. So thank you for that, David. As David said, uh, we have an upcoming uh, webinar from Desert to Oasis, and that will be on September 15th. Our good friend and consultant, Alejandro Carrillo, will talk about how he has used livestock to reverse desertification and restore native grasslands. Having been to Alejandro's ranch in Mexico, it truly is that much difference. Alejandro has done on grasslands what David has done on croplands. Also want to make you aware of a couple of Soil Health Academy schools that are upcoming. On September 22nd through the 24th, we will be on the McIntyre farm in Caldwell, Idaho, and we're gonna focus uh, that academy on regenerating your pocketbook with stacked enterprise systems. The McIntyres have developed a stacked enterprise model consisting of grass finished beef, pastured pork, uh, laying hens, turkeys, ducks, uh, grain crops that they sell for seed, a whole magnitude of different enterprises which uh, really supports a number of different family members. So we hope you can join us for that one. If your focus is on uh, grazing, we're gonna be holding another advanced grazing school uh, for ecosystem health and optimal profit at BDA Farm in Uninton, Alabama on October 20th through the 22nd. We encourage you to look at the Soil Health Academy website to view future upcoming academies. With that, we're, we have a number of questions coming in, David, so we will get right to them. The first question is this. It comes from Ben and Ben asks, do you use any compost, compost tea, compost extract, or any other biological stimulants, and why or why not? Okay, no, we have not used compost, compost teas or any of that. We have tried several biologicals uh, and uh, on new farms that we happen to rent, if it's been a conventional farm, we see the biological working maybe one or two years. As soon as we put a cover crop on that farm, we see no benefit to the biologicals. Uh, on our own farm, if we use biologicals, we see yields decline versus not using anything. Interest. Interesting, David. So our stance at understanding ag is one that if you want to try any of those products, go ahead and do so, but be sure and use a test strip. Be sure yeah. and have a test strip so you can see if there is a difference and then of course keep the economic data to find out if the use of that biologic is or is not profitable. Correct. The next question is from Tim and Tim asks, David, what rate do you plant the cereal rye to get that dense of a mat of residue? Uh, right now we're using uh, 60 pounds going to soybeans into corn fodder and no more than 30 if we're growing to corn. Would you care to elaborate on why no more than 30 going to corn? Well, I, I really think no more than 30 because we see a lot of times uh, the corn struggling to get through the thatch of the rye. Plus, uh, I think uh, sometimes they call it a green bridge effect. I'm just, to me, it's not a green bridge effect. It's because the rye has actually 
pulled all the nitrogen out of the soil. And if you don't add additional in with the rye, it suffers as a seedling because it comes up yellow and it takes probably three to four weeks for it to capture enough nitrogen in the soil to turn it back green. You know, uh, that's my conclusion on that. Uh, that's why we're staying in 30 pound or less. Thank it's a whole lot easier to plant into too, you know. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, just a comment from our friend Steve in Australia, Dave. Steve just puts a shout out to you, said many thanks. It was an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you, thank you. Next question. Do you store your seeds to keep out rodents and bugs? How do you store your seeds to keep out rod rodents and bugs such as weevils? Well, we, we store... Uh, we store on a farm here somewhere around 35,000 bushel of corn and about 10,000 bushel of beans. We always uh, treat the bins in the fall before we see uh, fill uh, utilize, fill them. We make sure they're clean. You know, none of the none of the bins ever have any grain that was left over, so we put new grain on. We also use a product called Diatomaceous Earth which is a white powder that I guess ruins the guts of the weevil if they eat it. And that seems to be how we are successful, you know, with that. Thank you. Next question. How well do the cover crops do with suppressing Palmer amaranth, Johnson grass, and other weeds without spraying? Um, we probably the best way to answer that is we can suppress uh, 40 to 60 percent of Johnson grass and Palmer, but we still have to use some herbicide, not a lot. Uh, if we get our rates up higher than we've talked about, and we know we have those in that field, we'll go as high as 120 pound with the rye or we'll be at a 12 or 14 weight species, which would be like 40 pounds of cover crop. Uh, the thicker you have the biomass and shut the sunlight off, the better you can control those weeds that need that sunlight to sprout and grow. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, I'm gonna ask David Kleinschmidt if he has anything to add to that, using cover crops yeah, for this weed control. Absolutely. So, I, you know, uh, going on with what David said there, that the more biomass that you have, the more weed suppression that you'll have uh, with that as well. Um, and it actually becomes really important if you're wanting to use your cover crops to suppress more weeds to actually lay them down and get them on the soil surface instead of just uh, planting into them and letting them stand upright. Um, you know, you, you armor that soil so much more and protect that um, soil from hitting, having any sunlight to get in those, those other species to germinate. You know, probably some of the, the weaker species that I, I have an issue with sometimes is, you know, foxtail and, and soybeans and some of them late season grasses. But <clears throat> as far as pigweed, uh, concerns or any of the larger seeded broadleaves, you know, that almost becomes non-existence with the uh, cereal rot. Hey, Gabe, this is Ray. Yes, Ray. I'd like to add to that. Um, uh, reaffirming what those guys have said, uh, the two Davids, Arkansas, uh, when I was the soil health specialist in Arkansas, we saved farms because of cereal rye. Farms were no longer being rent. Uh, nobody would want to rent some of the farms in Arkansas because Roundup resistant pigweed. But it was cereal rye that was able to salvage some of those farms and now they are being rented again. But if it wasn't for cereal rye, we would have not been able to save some of those farms. I, you know, I, I agree with Ray on that because I think rye, you know, Cereal rye will suppress broad leaves really well. The problem we have is the, the, gra the Johnson grass, it's really tough to suppress. Uh, you know, we can take everything out but the Johnson grass and we can suppress it, 
but it does come back, you know. We've never been able to totally eradicate Johnson grass with a cover crop yet. Thank uh, you. On, Thank on. you, David. Uh, one thing I think we should clarify here, David Kleinschmidt, would you please explain the difference between cereal rye and annual rye grass? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you think of cereal rye is like wheat, you know, it's, it's got, a, it produces a seed head like wheat. Um, you're looking at, um, if you're looking at seeds per pound, um, a species that's got somewhere around about uh, 18,000 seeds per pound compared to uh, annual rye grass, which is, it's more like a brome or a fescue type grass seed that can have up to 180,000 seeds per pound. So the um, cereal rye will be a grass species or a, a cereal that you'll be able to actually use a roller crimper to crimp down um, to terminate, whereas annual rye, it has a much thinner stem to it, and you can't crimp it to terminate it. Um, but there's a big difference even in the, the root structures of those two species. Annual ryegrass has a tremendous root, species, uh, root to it as well, but you really have to be cautious uh, with the annual ryegrass on, on where you're sourcing your seed from to make sure that you're getting a, a variety from a reputable company and not just a brand. Uh, we've had uh, some research in Southern Illinois with Mike Plummer, uh, the late Mike Plummer, who found out that some bags of annual ryegrass had up to six different maturities in them, uh, which became incredibly difficult to control. And there's some cheap brands that uh, labeled as annual ryegrass that are more of an Italian ryegrass. And they're very, very persistent every single year. And some, some farmers are not okay with that either. So it's really good to know the terminology whenever we're talking about cereal rye or annual ryegrass. Be very specific about these. Right. Th thank you, David. Those are excellent points. The next question is from Jason, and Jason asked David, any experience no-till cover cropping with vegetable production? Uh, we've done uh, a fair amount with uh, rye and hairy vetch and uh, some tomatoes. Uh, most of all our cover crops are in vine crops such as pickles, muskmelons, watermelons, pumpkins. Uh, we do use rye for beans and peas. Uh, it's really tough to have a cover crop for um, uh, things like uh, beets and stuff, and you know, where you're disturbing the soil. You know, uh, we have done some work with potatoes where we've laid. Uh, uh, straw or hay, I take a round bale of hay and roll them out, uh, lay the potatoes on top of the ground and, and take the round bale of straw and, and roll them out and done that. Uh, not on a large scale basis where we want tons and tons of potatoes, but enough to feed our own family, you know. Mm -hmm. And of course, Steve Groff and many others have been doing a lot of work with yes. uh, no-till cover cropping and vegetables. The next question is from Melissa, and I'm going to ask Doug Peterson to answer this question. And Melissa actually has two questions. Melissa asks, I have existing pastures and am not a farmer. Are there any seeds I can broadcast onto exposed areas, very sandy soil, so that I do not have to invest in equipment? Doug? You bet, Gabe. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, you know, I guess we'd have to look at why it's not growing there. It's probably really sandy, so it's, it doesn't have a lot of water holding capacity. Um, you know, one of the things I'm probably going to do if I'm not a farmer, if I don't have access to equipment, <clears throat> um, I might broadcast some things, but, but initially what I'm going to do is just graze that area with livestock. I'm going to use the, the, the trampling from the animals, the manure, um, <clears throat> to put some water and nutrient holding capacity into that sand. Um, I might even feed a little bit of hay on it. And, and I'm not talking about feeding hay in the winter, but maybe feed some hay 
<clears throat> through the growing season. That'll add a little bit of organic matter. It'll add, some, again, some water and nutrient holding capacity because that's what that sand is really lacking. Um, <clears throat> and I'm probably going to do that. If I am going to broadcast something, you know, <clears throat> it, it it's really not going to – most seeds that, that we would think of, cover crop seeds, um, they're going to have to have good seed-to-soil contact. You know, that's – annuals are not going to grow in that sand very well unless we get some good seed-to-soil contact. Um, you could use some trampling to, to, to trample those seeds in if you didn't have equipment. But again, you know, I'm probably going to use a little bit of hay on some, on some small – if it's a small area – um, and just use the natural trampling uh, impact from the livestock to start that process of healing. Would, would tough grass work in that situation where they could just throw it out there and grow? <clears throat> oh, a, a lot of different things would. I mean, depending on where you're at, um, if, if you're in the south, you know, you could, you could do some tough, you could do rye or barley or, or, or any of the cover crops, sweet clover, oats. Um, again, you know, generally we think of when we're talking about, you know, broadcasting to get a cover crop going or to get anything going, we're generally going to look at the small seeds, you know, the clovers, the <clears throat> things like that. But in this case, we really, we really don't want legumes. We, we want some grasses with some, with some really thick root systems with some carbon to them because that's what's, that's what that sand is really lacking. So, so teff, rye, barley, oats, wheat, um, those are probably where I'm going to start. If, if I have, have some way to get those seeds in contact with the soil, you know, trampling is a good way to do it. If I'm just going to throw them out there, boy, it's probably not going to be a very, very effective method just throwing them out there. Thank, thank you, Doug. David Riley asked this question. I am interested in rolling and crimping a warm season cover crop mix on my vegetable farm. Could you share your experience and thoughts with rolling warm season cover species such as sun hemp, sorghum sedan grass, cow peas, et cetera? Most of that has to be fairly mature to be able to break the stem. Uh, and it can be done. I think it takes about two passes to do it, most generally, sometimes three. But they need to be in the reproduction mode where there's uh, flower. At least, uh, at least 30 percent of those plants have to be in flower. Okay. And David, do you have any recommendations as to how diverse? to make those, these mixes if you are going to roll them down, since they'll be at different stages of maturity. How diverse? Um, How many different species would you want? Well, I think, I think if, you're looking, if you're looking at rolling species, you want species that's gonna mature similar, or if you're, if you're not, you wanna make sure that the species that is the longest maturing is what you're gonna roll for. You know, okay. because because the rest of them will be further along. You know, there may be some seeds in some of the rest of them. You know, David Kleinschmidt, would you have anything else to add to that? I'd agree with with what they said on there. Um, the other thing is, depending on the vegetable crop, when you're, you know, if you're using maybe a warm season to help build up some carbon levels in your soil profile and use it as kind of a biological primer year um, and then plant a vegetable crop into it the following year. Uh, if you're wanting something to overwinter, you really have to watch out on the allelopathy on some of the um, sorghums species and sedan grasses to some of the small cereals. Um, another thing to be cautious of, I guess, if there's mung beans or cowpeas in there, uh, if you're, you know, potentially planting maybe a bean crop in there that you could have some volunteer beans as well. So um, some of those won't be mature enough, like Dave said, to, to crimp when maybe the 
uh, warm season grasses are ready to be crimped anyways. And if you go out there and crimp them, you probably just lay them down and they'll pop right back up or continue to grow. It might require actually either um, some herbicide uh, to completely fully terminate them out. Um, or if it's late enough in the year, maybe uh, frost might take care of them too. But um, there's all kinds of options. we got a way out there too. Well, Thank you. I Go ahead, David. I, I, you know, I think another thing he could think about, especially with those warm seasons, if they weren't mature, if he would um, flail mow them, like with a flail mower or, or you know, a scythe or something, cut them off. Most generally, that'll kill them too. If they're just, if they're, you know, if they're starting to flower and you cut them off, they will die. Yep, depending on the species. Depending not, on the species, not, right. Yep, right. Not so much the sorghum sedan. Not so much the sorghum, but right. the peas and that stuff would all go. Right. right. Here's a million-dollar question from Magdalena. How long does it take to start being more profitable with these methods? David? Okay. I think you're profitable the first year if you're a conventional farmer and be willing to use rye in the rotation behind corn, going to soybeans, because we keep the tillage away from the soybean plants. You're not gonna do any fall or spring tillage, so that's gonna save you somewhere between 25 to 35 bucks an acre. We're gonna suppress some weed, so it may save you one herbicide pass, it could save you both, depending on how thick you plant the rye. And we're going to see a three to five bushel increase in the yield of beans. So with that all said, I think there's a possibility to save uh, between 35 to 50 bucks an acre the first year right out of the box. Okay, thank you, David. So Shane New is in charge of... Uh all of our consultants and works with a wide number of different producers all across North America. Shane, I'll pose that question to you. How long does it take to become more profitable when using these methods? Well, it depends on how intentional you want to become. I mean, you know, David really alluded to a lot of those factors. I mean, reducing overhead expenditures is a huge component, you know, getting that soil uh, you know. oh, we, we lost David, excuse me, we lost Shane, but uh, I will just uh, say that with our clients, typically, oh, sure. you yeah. know, on David remarks, you know, seeing, you know, yields, is, you know, from going. Oh. Yep. Kathy, Shane's having some difficulty. Would you please mute that? Um, he's traveling. But I would just say with our clients, we're typically able to increase profitability the very first year. Yes. And the way we start doing that is, number one, we do proper testing. Mm -hmm. Proper testing of both nutrients and biology. And then we use the proper amounts of applied nutrients if the producer is using uh, any uh, nutrients in their cropping system. In grazing systems, it's, it's also a matter of uh, adaptability, of uh, moving the livestock, giving adequate rest, uh, not overgrazing. So with these methods of going down using the six principles, focusing on the four ecosystem processes, we're able to increase profitability pretty much from year one. I, can I add another comment there, Gabe? Sure. Uh, I think we increase profitability immediately because we go from wherever they're at personally, at soil loss, whether it's five ton or 10 ton or two ton, and we cut it in half and go to whatever they end up with down to whatever, we have saved them 40% of their nutrient costs. They just need to understand they don't need to use as much the year that they put the cover crop there. You know, 
Excellent, excellent point, David. So this attendee asked, do you always prefer planting cover crops? What type of experience have you had with aerial seeding to allow it to get an earlier start? If it's raining and it's raining every day and you want aerial seed, I think it's great. My philosophy is if it's dry, don't fly. You know, it's not going to grow. But, you know, if we can get, if we can schedule applications of planes with a forecaster saying it's going to rain three days from now, we'll get a lot of guys to fly stuff on. And it's, and it's quite successful. But if you fly on and it don't rain for three weeks, you ain't got nothing. It's, it is about context, isn't it? What's yes, your sir. environment? Your environment. Yep. Very good. Uh, what would, do you recommend as a cover crop with a hard pan 14 to 18 inches deep in the South Carolina area? Well, I, I guess I would look at uh, uh, reddishes. I would look at uh, sorghum sedan. I would look at uh, sunflower. I would look at millet. Uh, and these need to have a long enough growing season to get what well, I'm going to call fairly close to maturing before they frost off. And I, I would just add to that, we would like to know a lot more of the context right. before we can really answer this question. What's the crop rotation? What was seeded there in the past? What's it going to next year? What type of herbicide was used? What time of the year? What's the moisture situation, et cetera? So we need to know a lot more before we can start making those recommendations. Shane hey, asked Gabe. you, oh, go ahead, David. Uh, if I may, you know, uh, Dr. Lloyd Murdoch in Kentucky has been doing research with you know, ryegrass on, um, on the Fragipan soils down here in Southern Illinois and in Kentucky. And we're actually showing that we can dissolve that Fragipan you know, almost a half an inch a year and gaining us about a half inch of, of topsoil just by using that cover crop. Thank you, David. That's good to know. So Shane asks, David Brandt, the research that you have been doing with the Ohio State University, is this available? And if so, where can they get access to this? Uh, you can uh, email me and I will send you that information or you can uh, email uh, Dr. Lafique Islam at osu.org. Uh, okay, thank you. David, your friend Simon in South Africa just wants to say thank you so much for openly sharing your decades of experience. You are a true pioneer. Thank you. Okay, Tim asks this, having planted covers for all these years, have you settled on an optimal cropping sequence slash cover crop mix, and what is the seeding rate? The answer is no. Uh, the reason I say that is that uh, for a number of years, we've been using an eight or a 10-way species. And so we have several farms that's had that 10-way or 8-way species on uh, four times. So that would have been 12 years of, of cover crops in corn and soybeans and wheat. And what we found is the third year, when we came back with the same 10 species, we lost corn yield. Why was that? We didn't change the diversity of the roots. So each time we change something in a blend that we like to use because we want to keep building diversity in the soil. Once the soil gets used to a certain number of roots or a certain number of enzymes, you need, I think, Dave Brand says, there's no research, but I think as we change those species, we see the soil getting much more active. The soil tends to get lazy, I think, we keep doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. That is a question. 
Very good advice. David, did you have something to add? That's very good advice. Uh, uh, we, we cannot keep doing the same thing over and over and over and expect different results, increase, increasing yields. It's not going to happen. So here's a really interesting question for you, Mr. Brandt. What are you working on next? Well, what am I working on next? David always has wild ideas. So this year, well, last year we tried, and this year we got serious. After we took 300 acres of small grains off and put cover crops in, we have planted sunflowers in rows with a corn planter, and then went back with the drill and under sowed either an eight or a 10 way species. And the goal will be to harvest the sunflowers as a crop to make me money to sell as bird seed or if it gets mature enough and has good germ, we will sell them as cover crop sunflowers. We also are doing the same thing with grain sorghum. We're using 50 day grain sorghum. Uh, with, don't make the mistake of putting large growing cover crops in that because they grow up above the grain sorghum and then you can't get it harvested. So we use clovers that short or grasses that short and we'll harvest grain sorghum that will have 12% protein to feed to our livestock and wow. still have a cover crop at the end of the year, which I think will beat double crop beans every day. You know what I, you know what Gabe thinks is the best part of what you just said. Yeah, right. Yeah. right I know <laughs> <laughs> the livestock. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, that that's great. That's great. Yes. You know, isn't it wonderful, people? Though how you have a person you hear with going on fifty years of experience, but yet they still want to learn and they're still trying new things, and yet how many people? Uh, they, they only grow corn or corn and beans and they're stuck in that rut and they're not willing to try new things. Boy, so hats off to you, David. Thank you. Here is a comment from Gord and out of respect to Gord, I'm not gonna try and pronounce his last name. But David, thank you so much for your willingness to share what you have done. So refreshing to get practical information we can apply on our farm. Thank you. Here, Mike has a question. Have you found that some covers are more effective at increasing earthworm populations versus other covers? Yes. Yes, we see, uh, we see cereals tend to, to bring more earthworm activity, especially when they're mixed with the brassica. For some reason, uh, and the brassica normally has been uh, uh, daikon reddish. Uh, and I think the reason for that is when the reddishes start decomposition in the spring, uh, their residue in the soil becomes a sugar. And that sugar attracts earthworms and our population quadruples where the reddishes are. Uh, it, uh, it seems to be uh, a hormone there that makes those uh, critters uh, a lot more productive. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? How about the other panelists, Doug or David, Kay, do you have anything to add on that? I'd agree with that. On the cereals and the brassicas, the uh, Sudan grass and the, the millets, they, they do a tremendous amount of a good job of bringing up earthworms. The same with, uh, with sunflowers, but <clears throat> I mainly see those when those species are, have decayed the following spring, and you'll just see a tremendous amount of earthworms in around those root systems. Thank you, David. And Gabe, one thing we haven't talked about is uh, the mycorrhiza fungi or mycorrhiza that's in the soils. And you know, there are plants that is a great mycorrhiza host, such as flax and, and oats. You know, those are the two most 
And that's why we try to have flax and oats in about all of our blends at some amount uh, so that we can actually start building more mycorrhiza fungi in the soil that will help the plants talk to the plants to make more crop. Very good. That's very good advice, David. Okay, Ben asks, is it necessary to clean seed that you reuse from the previous year? And if so, what small seed cleaner would you recommend for a small producer? I think, first, I think it's very important to clean your seed. I think it's very important that you do that to get the, if you happen to have any problem weeds that do bloom, like, you know, you'll find a lot of spring annuals that have seeds when you're harvesting small grains, such as onions and or leeks or uh, garlic and, and uh, all those uh, winter annuals that will mature early. Uh, I think it cleans it up. It makes it a whole lot easier to run through a drill. You know, uh, if you get a bunch of uh, heads or scab heads in a in a drill, it'll plug it. And I think it's more important to do a germination test, whether you send it off and spend thirty-five dollars or whatever it costs to get a germ test, or whether you put a hundred seeds in a paper towel for four days and see what grows. You know. Okay. Does anyone have any recommendations on a type of cleaner? Uh, of course, Clipper's been in the business for years. There's small ones, there's large ones. Uh, you know, uh, there's a couple out uh, that are using air and you, you drop the grain into the top of them and the air separates the bad from the good. Uh, they're inexpensive, but they're not 100% a good cleaner, if you get what I mean, you know. Okay. Thank you. Next question. I've had troubles with vole populations growing in cereal rye, then eating holes in the bean field the next year. It's bad enough you could see the voles, the holes on satellite. Do you have ideas to control voles? Uh, yes. I love coyotes. They do a good job. Uh, wild, you know, cats out of the, cat out of the pond, get, get a bunch of cats, that'll work. Or we've used a lot of cayenne pepper mixed with the seed, and that seems to help them. It won't kill them, but it'll deter them from eating the seed. David K or Doug, would you care to add anything to that? Well, that's another advantage of rolling down a cover crop too. Is uh, that with that cover crop flat on the ground, now the voles have to be up on top of that cover crop to to scurry around, and this makes them wide open to any type of predators, especially birds. Um, it seems like it's been, you know, for the last thirty, forty years. Let's tear out every fence row in in the county. Uh, livestock have left the farm, and that's taken away a lot of habitat for a lot a lot of our predator birds, including screech owls, which can eat a tremendous amount of voles in a night. So, you know, even putting up some screech owl houses around fields can help. But, um, you know, probably the biggest thing I've seen is, is helping with the rolling and crimping it. Uh, I will just add to that that McIntyre Farms, who will be hosting our academy in September, they were having vole problems and they did put up uh, owl boxes around their fields and tremendous success with it. And it's a combination, the rolling, uh, as David said, is, is number one, but don't forget about all the predators. So David, Aaron has a very good question. With commodity prices being a little lower, do you plan on changing your rotation in any way? I plan on changing my vocation. Rotation. Oh, rotate, rotate. rotation. Crop rotation. Not, no, not really. No. Because, you know, it's just so much easier for me to understand that this field goes to beans or this field goes to rye or small grains. Um, and um, 
you know, as we get as we get wheat and small grain production up, uh, uh, really high yields, you know, uh, we can make as much money with small grains as we can with corn and beans. Well, and I would just add to that, uh, look at the profitability and the break even right. that David has. Even at $3 corn, he is very profitable. And that's why at Understanding Ag, we, we say we will take profit over yield any day. We got to quit chasing yield in pounds and we have to start focusing on ecosystem function and the profitability that comes about as a result of it. Okay. So Shane has a question regarding heavy clay soils on pasture grazing dairy systems in New Zealand, very wet in winter, very dry in summer. If we plant a sorghum, radish, millet cover mix to break the soil, do we graze this over summer or just allow it to grow to maturity and graze in late autumn, then regrass? Doug Peterson, would you care to tackle that one? You bet. Um, you know, really, honestly, you could do it either way. Um, the sorghums, particularly, if you graze them uh, while they're still growing, don't, don't graze them all the way to the ground, but graze them about a halfway or two-thirds. It actually stimulates their uh, root mass, and, and they will help break up that heavy, heavy clay soil even a little bit better. Um, but, but if you just allow them to grow to their, to their full height through the fall, um, you know, you, you're going to get a big chunk of that benefit already. So really, you can do it either way. Thank you. Here's a question from Rodney. Your crops, David, corn, beans, wheat rotation. What would be cover crop rotation between those crops? Okay. Uh, from corn, we go to rye mixed with uh, uh, brassica. Uh, and maybe even uh, uh, oh, just had a purple flower, uh, blanza, and some blanza. Uh, on, and then we go to soybeans. From soybeans, we go to small grains, so there's no cover crop there. And then, as soon as the small grains come off, we go with a eight or a ten or a twelve way species, depending on what field it is. Very good, very good. It's important to address your resource concerns. First, you need to determine your resource concern and then use the cover crops to address those. Right. So here's an interesting question from Josiah and Josiah asks, any suggestions on cover cropping on native seed farms? We grow native grasses and flowers and flood irrigate to stimulate seed production. I'm thinking a cool season mix, but would love to get away from the tilling. Yep, Does it, do any of our panelists have any experience with that? Mm -hmm. I would just suggest to Josiah that he looks at the work of uh, Colin Sice yeah. in Australia, his no-kill cropping and Colin uh, plants cool seasons into his warm season natives and he's very successful at it. Colin Seis, S-E-I-S, no kill cropping. Next question is from Jerry and Jerry wants to know, David, are you planting naked corn and soybeans and wheat? Do you add inoculant for nitrogen fixation? We are planting naked seeds, and we do add inoculant for legume crops that we are planting, the right inoculant. Mm -hmm. And that's important to realize that these species of legumes take, many of them take a different inoculum. That's correct. Be, yes. be sure you have the right one. Right. <clears throat> Next question. On your long-term no-till cover crop fields in the winter and spring months with soils, <coughs> excuse me, excuse 
Excuse me, David, could you read that one, please? Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll get you, Dave. On your long-term no-till cover crop fields in the winter and spring months with soils, when soils are saturated, do you continue to see far less water runoff from those fields? And in those same fields, do they tend not to freeze down very far? That's correct, right? We do see that. <clears throat> because so, the reason is, is because we have so much biological activity uh, in the soils. We, we have, uh, you know, the nematodes and the protozoas and all those other big words. Uh, I was told by uh, a Missouri State University professor that we had accumulated it enough micro herd to equal four cows and four calves. So that would be, you know, 4,000, 5,000 pounds of warmth that we have over the winter that keeps our soils from freezing as hard as it does where they don't have it. Uh, and, that, go ahead, Doug. And, and the ground cover over the top just acts like the insul insulation. insulation. Right, right. We, we've had clovers and uh, vetches stay green all winter even though it was uh, 18 or 20 degrees so temp, you know. I would just like to add to that. Uh, you're actually able to extend your growing season as your soil health and the ecosystem functions right. advance. Yes. You're able to grow things longer after frost, like you said, David, and then you're able to start growing things earlier in the spring. So last question here for the evening is from Mike and Mike asks, we have had disease pressure in our grain crops and I contribute that to our covers. Is that a correct observation or are we just luckier than our conventional neighbors? <laughs> well, I, I guess I'd have to know a little more history on that because if it's a single species cover, I would say, yes, that could happen, you know? because you don't have the diversity of those other plants that bring other fungi and uh, beneficial things to help keep those diseases down. And, and we are seeing that, and David Kleinschmidt or Doug, please, please weigh in, but we're seeing less disease pressure if cover crops are used in a grain crop rotation. David or Doug, would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. And so looking at that question, the thing that, that uh, Mike had said was he is seeing less disease pressure than his conventional neighbors. And I'm actually very familiar with old Emmy down there in Southern Illinois. And um, yeah, he, he, he's using very diverse mixes and, and plus he's delaying his planting later. Um, it could be coupled with, you know, cooler weather during pollination, different things as well. But by protecting that soil like he is, he's not getting that soil splash up on those leaves as, as much. And he's just protecting that, that crop more with uh, probably a higher um, rate of photosynthesis throughout the growing season as well with the amount of CO2 that's even coming up off of that biomass that that crop is taking up. So that's just making that plant so much more healthier, more more resistant to the diseases. And plus, I mean, when you're using less less fertilizers, less synthetics, you're bound to have less disease pressure, uh, or you're, you're able to have less disease pressures too when you're not having so much nitrate and ammonium uh, concentration in that leaf tissue. Yeah, thank you for correcting me there, David. I apologize, Mike. I left out the word less disease pressure. Oh, I, I thought you said more yep. disease pressure. Yeah, I, I did. That Sorry. Was, <laughs> that was, no, that was my fault. Uh, David, we have one more question, if you have time, and this yep. will be our yep. final question. Josh asks, I've been planting oats from time to time uh, for my cereal in the three-year rotation after beans, located in southern Michigan. Is there a suggested cover before and that's all he says is before it was just uh it was just a screwy knot <laughs> you could fly on radishes 
Gabe? Yes, fly on radishes? Fly on radishes. Okay. Just repound the acre and then go ahead and plant the oats. Okay. And then the radishes will breathe out. I'm surprised the oats aren't freezing out, but you know. Well, spring planted oats, I'm sorry. He's spring planting the oats, right? It, it does not say. Oh, okay. Yep. I assume he's planting spring oats, so he could plant radishes and have that ground ready for spring oats. Huh? Well, David, on behalf of Understanding Ag and, and our team and Soil Health Academy, we sure want to thank you. That was a wealth of information and experience that you shared with us. Uh, we invite everyone to our uh, view our next webinar featuring Alejandro Carrillo from Desert to Oasis. And please take a look at the upcoming Soil Health Academies. With that, thank you, David. And thank you. Good day, everyone.